The universe is a mystery that has always puzzled us. How was it created and who is responsible for its creation? Let's take a look at the answer through a Vedic Indian lens. The multiverse theory basically suggests the idea that our universe might not be alone. There could be countless other universes out there, each with its own laws of physics and possibilities. This notion has captured the imagination of scientists and philosophers for centuries. But did you know that ancient India might have already hinted at such a cosmic concept? The multiverse concept really took off when modern scientific theories attempting to explain the properties of our own universe ended up predicting the existence of other universes where events take place outside our perceived reality. In Hinduism, the universe is not one single entity. There are infinite number of universes that are constantly being created and destroyed. In other words, we live in a universe that belongs to a multiverse. Lord Vishnu, who dreams the entire creation, is a personification of this multiverse. According to the Big Bang Theory, the universe originated in an unimaginably massive Big Bang, and material got thrown outwards from a single point. A blast of any kind throws material outwards, so expansion is quite logical. Dark energy is the form of mysterious energy that has a repulsive effect greater than gravity and thus makes the entire universe expand. In the next 100 million years, it will stop expanding and start contracting. And billions of years after that, the universe may meet its death. An identical concept is described in the Vedas. Every time he breathes in, infinite universes are created from the pores of his divine body. And when he breathes out, they dissolve again. Thus, breathing in and breathing out simulate the contracting and expanding motion of our universe. The Gita is a small part of the largest epic ever written, the Mahabharat. It's an account of a conversation between a young prince, Arjun, and his charioteer, Krishna, an incarnation of the god Vishnu. On the battlefield of the great war of Kurukshetra, Arjun lays down his arms in a tremendous moment of moral dilemma, as the enemy is his own kin, his cousins, teachers, and friends. Krishna reveals himself to Arjun in his true form, described as a blazing furious flame, a blinding ray of vision that was wondrous and sublime, yet fearfully dreadful, pure energy, devouring worlds and then spewing them once again in the dance between Shiva and Shakti. And at this moment Krishna says, I come as avarice time, in Sanskrit Kala, to seize and room in burning maw of mine the weakling's awe, and all the mortal meat of weary worlds of deathly change, and treat them with my nectar life to new and fearless better strife. Kala in Sanskrit is a word used for both time and space. It is one word. In yogic philosophy, time is the basis of space. It is because of time space exists, and it is because of time death approaches, and it is because of time the cycle of life, creation and death, the tempo of the universe, is maintained. In fact, this is what Oppenheimer was quoting when he tested the first atomic bomb. I remembered the line from the Hindu scripture, the Bhagavad Gita, now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. Krishna, the incarnation of Vishnu, had revealed himself as a manifestation of the ultimate reality, known as Brahman. The awareness of this reality is attained through the practice of yoga and meditation. Aham Brahmasmi is the statement of this realization and identification synonymous with the concept of moksha or nirvana. The concept of Brahman and moksha are integral to Indian philosophy. However, until recently, they had not been subject to scientific scrutiny. Physicists have discovered that the various quantum fields which underlie all physical reality arise from one common source, namely the unified field. The unified field theory has a goal of proposing a connection between two primary realities, the unified field and consciousness. To grasp all this, we need to understand the quantum world in a little more detail. Even the most sophisticated scientific equipment does not allow us a glimpse of the natural realm of some atomic particles. We can only analyze it mathematically. At such a microscopic scale, particles and waves can exist simultaneously. Quantum systems also display other bizarre behaviors, which physicists call quantum weirdness. For instance, a quantum particle can simultaneously be at more than one place or take more than one path. John Wheeler and Michio Kaku, the foremost theorists about space and time, believe that the mysteries of consciousness and quantum physics are linked.
The theory that consciousness emerged as a consequence of the unique features of our universe has become a topic of much scientific discussion. It is called the Anthropic Cosmological Principle. It proposes that the laws of nature are precisely crafted, otherwise intelligent beings like us would not have emerged to ask the question, who am I? Krishna's revelation to Arjun in the Bhagavad Gita states, Wise individuals with their intellects steeped in wisdom renounce attachment to the fruits of their actions. Through this detachment, they liberate themselves from the cycle of rebirth, attaining a state transcending all suffering. Imagine yourself as a reflected consciousness, akin to seeing your reflection in a mirror. In the illusion of Maya or the Matrix, we mistakenly identify with this reflection. Recognizing your true nature entails understanding your connection to Brahman, the pervasive consciousness. Indian philosophers guided by logic came to the conclusion that all our experience stems from one single unitary source, one absolute reality referred to as Tat, which also parallels the unified field theory. Tat manifests in myriad of forms constituting the vastly different realities of human experience. To our final question, who am I, they gave one final answer, tat tvam asi. In quantum physics, consciousness plays a vital role. It is ironic that our prized, objective knowledge of science is assembled through a subjective device, human consciousness. No quantum phenomenon is a phenomenon until it is observed in a communicable form by conscious observers. For example, a property of a particle can only manifest when it is observed. Therefore, consciousness is an integral part of the nature of our universe. Most modern scientists today lean towards the view that consciousness is a byproduct of the neurochemical processes occurring in our brain. They say it depends on these processes and cannot exist without them. On the other hand, the Upanishads hold an idealist view that consciousness exists by itself and that the physical world depends on it. There is no objective reality that exists independently of the observer. According to Hindu scriptures, consciousness is not something that comes about merely through the connection of neural pathways in the brain, but is a basic characteristic of all reality, a spirit pervading all manifestations. The human body simply provides an appropriate material structure to individualize this consciousness. Brahman is the ultimate reality, an unchanging cosmic spirit that forms the divine essence of the universe. It's not just a deity or a figure, but an all-encompassing presence that exists beyond time, space and form. Brahman is considered immanent, meaning it dwells within every aspect of the universe, yet it's also transcendent, existing beyond the physical realm. It's a concept that challenges us to look beyond the material world and recognize a deeper, spiritual dimension that connects all forms of life. Erwin Schrödinger was first exposed to Indian philosophy around 1918 through the writings of the German philosopher Arthur Schopenhauer. An ardent student of the Upanishads, Schopenhauer had declared, In the whole world there is no study so beneficial and so elevating as that of the Upanishads. It has been the solace of my life, it will be the solace of my death. But what had he read that captivated him this well? You see, the nature of Maya and illusion is Anandi Bhava, beginningless. However, it is Anadi Santam, with an end. It is ended by absolute wisdom, arrived at through intense meditation. Maya differs from Brahman in that Brahman is beginningless and endless. The origin of ignorance cannot be found out, but it is well known that sages who have realized the eternal Brahman free themselves from the effects of Maya. It is easy to see why such a concept would have appealed to Schrodinger. Quantum physics insists that reality exists as waves, and wave-particle duality arises due to our observation. Because we cannot perceive the true nature of reality, our observation reduces it to an incomplete reality that we see. This reduction is what we know as the collapse of the wave function. The emergence of Maya thus neatly maps to this collapse. The Upanishads also speak of the concept of neti neti, which means not this, not this. In this practice, you drop whatever is not you. Therefore, if I can see this camera, I am not this camera. If I can see my hand, then I am not this hand. In the same way, because I can feel these feelings, I am not these feelings. If I can remember these memories, then I am not those memories. 
So by definition, anything I can experience, I am not that. So as we keep letting go, layer by layer, what we're left with is just a vacancy. This is the kind of vacancy that includes everything. This ancient idea suggests that reality can be described by negation. Much like quantum physics describes particles by their wave functions, defining them by what they are not. And thus, the discoveries of modern quantum physics seem to parallel Vedic conjectures about the nature of our reality. I encourage you to dive deeper into your heritage and explore the rich wisdom it offers. Namaste.